industrialscripts.co.uk, home of the Insider Interviews, a series of Q&As with people currently working at various levels and in different areas of the British film industry. The interviews are absolutely exclusive to Industrial Scripts and can't be accessed anywhere else. Into the Blast Furnace this month, we welcome leading literary agent Nick Marsden of Curtis Brown. He began his career at Methuen before joining AP Watt, where he worked with the books department, developing and selling books for film and television. In 1997, he arrived at Curtis Brown with the intention of re-establishing its presence in theatre, film and television, and in 2008 set up Cuba Productions with Tally Garner. He currently represents an extensive list of writers and directors. This interview was produced by Evan Leighton Davis and edited by Steve McCarthy. Someone who has no idea what a literary agent mm. does or is, mm. how would you define yourself and, and what you do in your profession? I work with writers and directors and some producers, um, and I am the first port of call between them and the outside world. Um, it's my job to um, be there for them to um, give them support very often that is actually sort of emotional and um, uh, uh, um, uh, loving spiritual spiritual exactly <laughs> support um, uh, in slightly more pragmatic terms um, I'm there to try and interpret the often bewildering world of film and television to sort of try and help them navigate through it. I'm there as a resource of material to try and find for them, uh, literary material very often, in other words, books, if they're screenwriters um, looking to adapt something. I'm also there to look at their material, to look at what they do. Again, very often, I will read uh, the scripts before they go to the producer or to the director, um, again as a kind of first port of call, as a kind of um, bridge between them and the outside world. And finally, I'm there to try and help them make a living, which involves finding them work, negotiating their contracts, um, analysing what rights they have, trying to exploit those rights, trying to protect those rights for them. So those are the kind of four areas, I suppose. Sure. Like and so when did the first, uh, when did the idea of being an agent first come onto your radar? I'm in the peculiar position of having grown up knowing what a literary agent does. It's the kind of job where if you meet someone at a party and say, what do you do? And you say, I'm a literary agent, they then look completely blank. And I bizarrely uh, had a grandmother who was an agent, another grandmother who was a publisher, a grandfather who was a writer, and the other grandfather was nothing to do with it at all. My parents were both doctors, and they were then appalled when the alternate gene theory came in and it reverted back to uh, me being an agent. But there's no doubt that one particular grandmother, who was my Romanian grandmother, was a huge influence on me. She came over during the war, escaped Romania, worked at the BBC in foreign service, and I saw how she did it, which was a very different world then. This is, um, uh, I knew her in, I guess, kind of 70s and 80s, and she started quite late in life, in her 50s. And I saw how she did it. She did it with... Uh, European languages she did it really as an extended party she had a lovely house in the middle of London um, and used to have the most extraordinary people around there like Jean Genet, Samuel Beckett was a client so whenever he had a play on down the road at the Royal Court he would come round there usually you know Nesco who was a Romanian playwright she represented lots of European publishing houses such as Gallimard, Zurkamp um, and she discovered he needed Blyton which was a great coup for her the great thing that she, I learned lots of things from her just kind of looking at it. One of the things I learned was that she absolutely respected Enid Blyton every bit as much as Samuel Beckett and took them both very much on their own on their own terms. I think one of the things that's very key for an agent to be is you can't be a snob, really, in terms of uh, in terms of taste. Uh, as I say, it was a very different world, and she just did it, I think, as a kind of extended party. But 
I did get a taste of, uh, of the life. And what I've always been into is the reading side material, and I've always been into the commercial side as well. So it's someone who sits between those two of working with material, working with writers and directors, but within a commercial environment somehow suits my temperament well, it seems. Sure. And how did you go about becoming an agent? I studied languages, studied German and English, so languages and literature. Came out, had no idea what I wanted to do. Started working uh, in a bookshop uh, with Tim Waterston, uh, who was very encouraging. This was in the early days of Waterstons. Uh, he then gave me a job doing their literary diary, which was great. So I went off and sat in a library and researched 52 authors, one a week. And realised, I used to have an annual meeting with Tim Waterston, who would always say, you really shouldn't be working here. He would say this to everybody who was there. They would say, we really like having you, but it really is time you left. <laughs> so uh, I uh, took him at his word and got a job working as a secretary in Methuen for their publicity department, which was the year that Peter Brook and Arthur Miller published their autobiographies. So part of my job was carrying books around for them at various signing sessions. And Methuen was a fantastic theatre publishing house as well. I got to know a guy called Nick Hearn, who's still a very good friend. And I started seeing his relationships with playwrights, with theatre material. And I started to realise that actually, rather than the book publishing side, what I was actually interested in was going towards the theatre and film side. So I moved from Methuen to a company called AP Watt, where again I was lucky enough to find another mentor called Rod Hall, who, who sadly died. And together we started looking for new writers, both theatre and film, and we worked with all their book material there in terms of selling rights. And it was an incredible period, which you realise now, now looking for new writing, you think, my God, we were so spoiled at that time. There was one year where between us, we found 10 writers who've all gone on to have extraordinarily major careers. Names like Colin McPherson, Martin McDonough, Lee Hall, Simon Beaufoy, Jeremy Brock, um, Marco Rowe, uh, Jez Butterworth. Old Parker, there's a whole list of several I've... Uh, Jose Amini, um, I must not forget him, <laughs> um, who's still a fantastic writer, Ender Walsh. So working with Rod, he was a superb mentor, he was very driven by the material, by taste, by identifying individual writers who needed very individual representation the one thing about it, Rod used to say uh, when I, whenever I would find a script which I quite liked I would give it to him, I don't remember what his great phrase was it doesn't quite pass the so what test mm. um, and he was brilliant at educating me in terms of looking for writers and looking at material of realising that whatever someone writes it has to be very peculiar to them you have to have a sense that it could only really come from them and a lot of the writers at the time who were writing not always the most accessible theatre, for example, who've gone on to write very commercial films. For example, the Irish writers, a lot of them work writing monologues, and a lot of people at the time said they'll never be able to write dialogue, let alone film dialogue, but it's absolutely not true. And, you know, we took them on when really what they'd written at the time were monologue plays, but they were very extraordinary plays. How did you make the transition to Curtis Brown? So I worked at AP Watt for about 10 years, and that was great. And I sort of saw an opportunity to come to Curtis Brown, which was a similar place, but there was a very, at the time, a very dormant theatre, film, television side. They did have a good tradition of that. A lot of the agents had left a few years back. Curtis Brown, along with AP Watt, is an agency of over 100 years old. I think they're probably older, the two oldest agencies in the world. And it, like AP Watt, an incredible literary tradition. So all the great writers of the time were effectively either with AP Watt or with Curtis Brown, Buchan, Morn, Wells, K. 
Kipling, P.G. Woodhouse, um, whole lists of them, Daphne du Maurier, um, C.S. Lewis, all these writers were all either at Curtis Brown or A.P. Watt on the whole because they were the two agencies who I think were around. Um, and so I saw there was a huge opportunity there in terms of the backlist, in terms of the material, it just needed rebuilding and we were very lucky when I arrived to have the windfall of what we call the honeypot of Winnie the Pooh where the Disney merchandising income came to the reach such a point that they decided Disney that they wanted to negotiate with the copyright holders to buy out the income streams so they wouldn't have to pay these huge royalties so that deal was done and that enabled Curtis Brown through their portion of commission to affect a very um, harmonious uh, handover of the agency between the departing shareholders who essentially took quite rightly uh, most of the income that came in but we were able to take the agency, the new generation, as it were, were able to take over the agency and rebuild it, which is what we've now done over the last 10 years or so. Sure, and you've also got a an actor's division now, yeah. of course, as well. We've done several things over the last 10 years, which I don't think Curtis Brown has ever done in its last previous... And a production company, so of course. We have a production yeah. company, so... One of the things that I always wanted to do was to build up an actor's division. We started with a great actor's agent called Sue Latimer, who sadly went off. I think she never believed that we'd take over the company, but she sadly went off and worked with uh, Michael Foster. She was brilliant, and that gave us the taste for representing actors, um, which makes absolute sense. If you're working, film writers don't work in a vacuum. They have to work with directors and producers and actors, they're crucial to the whole package. They're also crucial to, within an agency, they're crucial to the flow of material coming through. So we see a lot of the scripts that come through for the actors, and equally we help the actors with material here. So um, we started again a few years ago. We brought in some agents from London Management. We brought in someone called Sarah Spear, who runs the actors' division, who's done absolutely fantastically. And the policy, their policy has been to find a new generation of actors to really focus on a lot of young talent coming through. It's actually what PFD did about 10 years ago. If you look at PFD, they have a whole generation of terrific young actors who come through incredibly quickly, and frankly, they've done brilliantly, the actors department, and they've very quickly become probably the most profitable area of the company, and certainly the most vibrant area of the company representing actors such as Robert Pattinson, uh, which is clearly the plant that my daughters are most interested in, <laughs> uh, Dev Patel, uh, Kaya, you know, who is in Skins, who's just about to play the lead in Wuthering Heights, which one of our writers has written, whole generation of great young actors, and the production side indeed. Yes, of course, yeah. Which was another thing that I'd always wanted to do, I always thought it made sense to work with the assets that we have, which is a great literary side, so a great book side, and fantastic relationship with screenwriters, it always struck me that the magic formula is to try and put those together and that we are in a particularly good position because we know what we know the writers very well and we have fantastic access to the material. So it just struck me as a great way of laying a foundation stone for a production entity. It also makes sense that because we have a very solid business with a recurring turnover of an agency, half the problem with production companies is trying to keep going. They make one film and then they have to go back to the beginning and try and make another. What we can do is keep a very, very solid basis, as I say, of the agency turnover, which gives us the space and time to be able to develop without huge overheads, frankly, to develop projects. So we did Boyer a few years ago and that went incredibly well. And that was the key to that was putting together a book that we represented here, which is a very neglected book at the time. I'm glad to say that thanks to the film, it's now been re-regarded. But uh, a great book and a terrific writer called Marco Rowe, who loved it when we showed him the brilliant screenplay. And then we set it up with Channel 4 Television, uh, which John Crowley did it superbly. 
Andrew Garfield great lead performance and uh, I'm glad to say we managed to then sell that for release as a feature film to the Weinstein Company and it won five BAFTAs so it was a very happy experience for everyone You yourself won the Vogue Young Writer of the Year Award. Were you never kind of tempted to go down that road and also reading so much, I guess, inevitably substandard material during your career? Um, were you never tempted to think, as so many development people and agents do, maybe I can do better? No, I, I think the crucial thing is I don't, because one of the various things happened. I did start, I, I wrote, there was a year when I was actually combining the two, First of all, I nearly exploded with the amount of kind of work I had to do. Secondly, there was this inevitable clash when I started to review books. This was at AP Watt, which were represented by the agency, so there was a, a, a conflict there. And thirdly, I started looking at some real writers, such as Jez Butterworth and Connor McPherson, who were coming through, and I very quickly realised that although when I receive some bad scripts, I may, in my more fanciful moments, have thought, oh, I'm sure I can do better than that. Actually, the job of an agent really did educate me about what real writers can do. And uh, I, so the short answer is absolutely not. I don't think you can combine two A and B. I don't think I'm not self-deluding enough to think that I really ever could. It actually, the time I was doing those articles and things, just uh, has given me even more admiration for anyone who can look at a blank page first thing in the morning as their full-time job and carry it off is quite extraordinary so I'm glad I did that but absolutely not no what's kind of a typical day in the office for you does it does one exist or is it so variable the way you run your day and the way you run your time does become a really crucial element I can observe some agents who haven't managed to quite make the job work for them and very often it's to do with the fact that they haven't quite learned how to allocate their time and energy. Because unlike lawyers, sadly, we don't charge by the hour. So it really is the whole time you're having to make these on-the-spot decisions about where you put your energy and your time and your efforts. And if you put it into the wrong places, it becomes very demoralising for you and for the people you're working with very, very quickly. So there isn't any particular set pattern. It's a matter of dividing your time. I try and read early in the morning. You have to read. If you go into the office without new material in your head, it ends up being like a restaurant that hasn't got any new food. You, need, you always need to have new ideas, new scripts, new enthusiasms, new books new goals, new clients that you would like to take on in your head, or as I say, the whole thing um, grinds to a halt alarmingly quickly. Uh, it's then a matter of, as I say, dividing a time between looking after the writers, clients, directors, who absolutely need your time. Very often, they really do need quite long telephone conversations. Um, and time and actually doing contractual work as well because that is part of the job as well is making sure that the contracts are going through that they're getting paid that the money is getting chased and everything what I've realised over the years which is something we've managed to build up at Curtis Brown is you do need to have a really solid system so actually a client needs not just you but a whole team of people so that we have a very good lawyer here who helps on the contractual side. So, for example, if we're dealing with a television format creator, we can we immediately know what the templates are, what the um, precedents are, and having a lawyer to pool all those with is very, very important. We have a whole account team who chase and process all the money. So some of that does come off your shoulders, but... It, it really is a, it's a non-stop, it is a non-stop job, because even if you're not doing it, you're worrying about it. Um, what's the part of the job that you enjoy the most, or the, or the part that you get, I guess, the biggest kick out of? 
And and also has that changed through over time? No, I think it's very consistent actually. I think it is having your instinct. It's when your instinct is born out. So it's when you read something or see something and it just sort of connects with you and if that is then borne out by the success that it has with other people, that is the most satisfying. It's obviously particularly satisfying if you feel you can play a role, however minor, um, in creating that success or helping to create that success. So it's when you see something at early stages and you put it together with someone else, you think there's a match to be made there, that's enormously satisfying. If that works, uh, it's brilliant. I mean, there are various instances I can think of where that's been very, very satisfying. So, obviously, we don't really use this phrase over here, but the, the, the word and phrase packaging is mm. used a lot in the US. And do, do you feel that's sort of the area where you, you derive a lot of pleasure yes, as well? Yes, it's not Because a obviously word. you rep writers yeah, and directors. That's right. So. That's right. It's, the packaging isn't the word that... I particularly like, partly because in America it has a very particular business connotation, which is that the American agencies cleverly, I think, have managed to take packaging fees on, for example, long-running TV series by involving all sorts of the elements in there. We don't. Maybe we should. We don't. So I think it's quite a dangerous thing that it's actually suggesting, unless you are producing, which we have done and would like to continue to do, it's important not to confuse your roles. So you can't force elements together when it's not actually your place to do it. For example, if you sell a book, you can then obviously push as forcefully as you can your writers. Sadly, once you option that book, is actually going to be the producer's choice in the end or maybe the financier's choice as to who adapts it or who directs it. Where you can... Where in a sense, I think it can work well, is more matchmaking. For example, I remember when I read The Girl with the Pearl Earring and immediately thought of a writer we look after called Olivia Hetreed who read it. And I remember when she read it, her response to it was quite extraordinary. It wasn't sort of, you know, I like this book. It was, I really have to adapt this book. It was almost, I was born to adapt this book. <laughs> and she at that time hadn't really, she'd really written more... Um, she's written some great children's drama it wasn't an obvious choice for adapting it but did a fantastic job on it and was Oscar nominated I believe uh, uh, BAFTA um, nominated BAFTA nominated wasn't Oscar but uh, recently for example we look after John le Carre um, I was able to match his new book which was a very that still is an exciting project to be involved with so matched his new book our kind of traitor, which I think is out next month, with one of our writers, Jose. Good Mimi. plug. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. In all good bookshops. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and online. <laughs> um, uh, with Jose Namini, who is a terrific Oscar nominated screenwriter. And that match has so far worked fantastically, both in terms of the material, and then it's been a really fascinating process to observe the two of them who have been a brilliant sort of marriage together. And just whilst we're on the subject of this of packaging um, an area I'm interested in that doesn't kind of exist over here is the phenomenon of the lit manager what's yeah. your take on the do you mean the, in theatre in film in the US I guess ah I don't think I know a lit, well they have literary managers here in theatres obviously not as much as for example in Germany when there's a dramaturg but the literary manager in theatre uh, which you see they don't have so much in television but their job, obviously, is to find the plays, assess the writers and manage relationships with writers, various theatres, if they can afford them, the National, the Court, uh, the Bush, maybe, have literary managers. There are script editors, if you like, uh, who work particularly within television, uh, who can have, a, clearly, a very important role in these straitened times. I think they very often are quite a sort of um, threatened item in the budget. In terms of film, there is a you could argue strongly that there isn't enough literary management, if you like, that actually writers very often find themselves quite adrift mm. in terms of um, 
because obviously as a US writer, you've got your your three pronged team, I guess, of agent, manager, and then attorney. Yes. Whereas here, sorry, you mean? Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. You mean? Oh, sorry. You mean a manager in terms of representation? Yeah. I'm sorry, I misunderstood you. Um, yes, it is true, and we have clients who have who we look after here, and they have a manager in America, and they have an agent, and they have a lawyer, and sometimes they have a business manager, and sometimes mm. they have a well, they don't really have publicists on the whole. Um, but actors sometimes have all of those mm. and more, mm. and that's before we get into therapists. And, <laughs> uh, but I, I think that the role of manager is quite interesting in America. It's not that far off what we do over here. Managers, obviously, unlike agents, are allowed to produce in America. They very often have closer relationships with the clients because they can have the time and have more time than some of the bigger agencies. Um, so I think that the managers in America, actually a lot of them, a lot of those companies as well, again, no, the analogy over here I would suspect would be those companies that have evolved from being representation companies into quite major production companies. That's happened in America quite a lot. So companies like I don't know, Brillstein Gray, Three Arts, um, have all started our, our management companies who also produce over here, companies like Tiger Aspect or Talkback, uh, even to an extent of Hattrick, those are particularly comedy, interestingly, those have all started off as really management companies that have mm. then evolved into production companies. But I think the role of the manager in the US is an interesting one, and, and it's probably slightly closer to the role of the agent in the UK than maybe the agent is. Okay. Um, moving on, I guess your own sort of taste. What what yeah. are you most looking for in a in a new writer? Or mm. as I was saying, as I learned at AP Watt under Rod, it has to be. It's an individuality. It's a very hard thing to do in terms of being a writer or a director. It's something that, in the end, it doesn't really work if it's something you just want to do it's something that you have to do and so there has to be something that you've identified within them that is utterly compulsive that's compulsive to their desire to write or direct and it's compulsive on the page or on the screen in their work so it is that particular unique individual element okay Starting to sound like Sam <laughs> In terms of the various deals you've been involved in down yeah. the years, what can you pick out any highlights in terms of, I guess, excitement or satisfaction or the one I remember at the time I I became momentarily uh, not exactly famous, but there were a couple of articles written about it because I sold the Horse Whisperer by a writer called Nick Evans when I was at AP Watt to Robert Redford uh, Disney for a vast sum of money at the time and that was hugely exciting to kind of witness the Hollywood auction funny enough they don't tend to happen in that way in terms of material very much anymore but I remember at the time in doing, saying that actually it was an easier deal to do than getting a play on at a Bush theatre <laughs> Uh, which uh, uh, which actually is, uh, is is curiously true. So I don't know if it's the deals I'm proudest of. I, I think the things that will live the longest probably are going to be on me, the things that in a certain sense have nothing to do with me, but I remember looking at a very early draft of Mojo by Jez Butterworth, thinking that was quite extraordinary, and that ended up going on as one of the first new plays on the main stage of the court, I think, since Look Back in Anger. I remember seeing a play by Conor McPherson called This Lime Tree Bower and then within a year he had written within in two weeks to write it The Weir I remember reading that thinking my god this is a play that will probably last a lot longer than me or him and we put on for many many years to come so I don't know whether it's quite those deals but those are certainly moments that you look back on and you think that's very exciting to be associated with a piece of material or indeed a film or a book that you sense, you know, is going to outlast all of us. And moving on to your kind of own ambitions, mm. moving forward, where where do they lie, and and do you do you aim to spend more time, perhaps, on producing? Or? I still think that 
uh, if we get the mix right here, and if we can get, we got some fantastic. There's a whole group of fantastic younger people working here at uh, Curtis Brown, which is great. It's never in the past. I think at Curtis Brown, it's partly because of its foundation as a established literary agency, hasn't always been brilliant at bringing through young talent, which is hard to do. Bring it through because it's a very difficult job, the Asian income job. And it's a very odd and peculiar job. And because we've got some very good young people coming through, I hope we can get the structure worked out that we can actually exist in terms of producing some really good material. It has to be, I think, high quality, using the kind of high quality people we have, um, and expanding and running the agency. I'm glad to say over the last few years we seem to be getting bigger and more successful year on year. So I see absolutely no reason why we shouldn't do that. We're trying to do new things such as in this digital age we've invested a lot of time effort and money this year in a new website which is coming on soon which we hope is going to revolutionise the way that rights can be handled and sold all the way from publication rights for foreign sales for example to plays uh, being put on in theatres around the world. We're going to have a sort of passcode system so that producers and theatres and broadcasters can access material from us online quite easily. I hope they'll be able to see show reels. Mm. I think it's crucial to be constantly refining the service that, uh, that we're offering. And for someone who would like to be an agent, what what advice would you give them? See, read, watch, listen to as much as you possibly can. The when I look at some of the young American agents, um, America obviously has an incredibly well structured agency system, better structured than ours. There are less agencies there. They are bigger than ours, but within them. There are undoubtedly better structures that kind of for young people to kind of come through. But you look at some of the young people coming through the American agencies; they work so hard. What they call their coverage is extraordinary. So you look at young agents; they know which books are coming out. Very often, you find that American agents know more about some of the talent coming through the UK than than we do, and that's through keeping their ear close to the ground. You have to be mobile. You have to be quick. You have to be determined, and you have to be canny, and you mustn't give up. <laughs> Not too much to ask. <laughs> um, okay, here's a question from one of our Twitter followers for you. Yeah. Um, he writes, will digital self-publishing, i.e. your Kindles, yeah. Amazon Kindles, etc., become the literary equivalent of satellite TV, i.e. dozens of channels all showing repeats and... Uh, I guess poorly written shows and ebooks, where the readers, viewers have to do their own prospecting um, to find the gold nugget. If so, how will literary agents continue to assess quality? So I guess what he's saying in in this sea of material where anyone mm. can be published, mm. how do you structure your a search that big? Well, I think that we have no other choice other than to see digital advances and technological advances as great opportunities because they're going to be happening anyway. So if we don't see them as opportunities, we are stuffed. So actually, the fact that you can get material on the web or you can make your film and put it on YouTube or you can be a comedian, we started up a comedy wing is our new thing. The new clients we're finding nearly all of them are coming through YouTube are just putting their material on there which is finding a huge normally young audience incredibly quickly before for example the broadcasters can have anything to do with it the broadcasters are having to play catch up they're going from YouTube very often into shows on TV and things mm. so there are huge poss there are huge possibilities there it is true it's a very interesting question that the roles of if you like, the gatekeeper 
is going to become slightly different. I think in a certain way, the role of the gatekeeper, if you can get good gatekeepers, they will be even more valuable within, as you put it, this sea. As I was saying, one of the roles of the agent is to try and navigate um, through this jungle. If the jungle's becoming more dense, then you have even more need of a good guide. Everyone does, and everyone's going to need individuals who are professionally or spend their life doing it um, to try and pick out the nuggets. But I just think that you have to as an agent, given the fact that so much the frustration is you see talented people who somehow don't have the means or can't get the means to get their work out, if some of those blocks are removed, you have to regard it as an exciting opportunity. And as I say with our website, what we're trying to do, I think, is trying to embrace that so that, I remember when I first started, the only way of getting a writer or a filmmaker known was that there would be a handful, a very small handful of people who were able to make a decision and you had to lobby or put it in an envelope or hope for a meeting or better, a lunch. Now, there's still elements of that, but I think the fact that that system is slightly crumbling and that it's all being thrown up in the air and is all somehow much more up for grabs has got to be exciting. Quick fire round. Your favourite ever film? Cabaret. The best script you ever read? Is that the best script that has been sent to me by a potential client or client. Yes, let's go with that. Yes, I think that would be Intermission by Marco Rowe. Okay. Your favourite screenwriter? Is Paul Atanasio, I would okay. say. Who wrote? Who wrote, which is my favourite screenplay, Quiz Show. Okay, that was the next question. Uh, your favourite director? Mike Nichols. Favourite performance by an actor? Is Robert De Niro, I'd say, Taxi Driver. Good choice. Favourite TV show? Is Mad Men. <laughs> Again, a very good choice. Uh, Michael Mann or Martin Scorsese? Martin Scorsese. Shane Meadows or Ken Loach? Ken Loach. Pacino or De Niro? Pacino. Kerry Mulligan or Emma Watson? Kerry Mulligan. Popcorn or Pick and Mix? Popcorn. The last film you saw... Toy Story 3. Last film you loathed? Uh, Invictus. Invictus. Clint won't be happy. No. Uh, last film you loved? Toy Story 3. And your filmic guilty pleasure? Working Girl. And your dream dinner party guests? Uh, John le Carré, Illy Nastasi, Carla Brunei, and Emily Blunt. They're very lovely. Nick Larson, thank you very much. Thank you.